either by mapping that large area or by marking down um, the galaxy. Uh, this particular event, that, that 28 square degrees, was only visible for the first couple of hours after sunset. And so minutes after sunset, about 10 and a half hours after, um, uh, uh, after the merger of the two neutron stars, a candidate transit was reported in this galaxy, NGC 4993. And you can see there's nothing here in a reference image. Um, I'm sorry, this is actually a uh, yeah, reference image from the future, and there is a, a bright transit here on August 17, 2017, 10 and a half hours after the merger. Now this is the first surprise. The transit was so bright. Um, at the time of discovery, uh, by the 40-inch smoke telescope at, uh, at Carnegie Observatories, the transit was 17th magnitude. Um, so you can just look at that image and, and see it. You don't need to do um, any, any elaborate processing to find a very faint source buried inside a very bright host. Um, this is actually very, very straightforward. And this transient was not only bright at the optical wave bands, it was bright across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So within minutes, all of these different telescopes that were searching for the optical counterpart detected it across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, when there are photons, there are papers. There are about 84 papers on this object that have been written just in the last uh, few months. Um, so there's no way for me to do justice to all of them in, uh, in less than 30 minutes. Um, so I'm going to focus on some of the work that we've done here uh, locally, uh, uh, primarily in the ultraviolet, infrared, and radio feedbacks. We put together trial papers um, that, uh, that were all published on October 16, 2017. But the science here is absolutely majestic. Um, not only was this transient uh, first discovered in, in gamma rays and then um, the coordinates localized to the galaxy in the optical, it was ended up being detected in the ultraviolet, infrared, radio, X-ray, all the different wave bands. Now, the radio and X-ray were the hardest. They required persistence and patience because they didn't turn on um, until several days later, and you have to wait for Greg to tell you why. Um, now, uh, this transient was so bright that it was hidden, it was accessible by uh, just about any telescope that could, um, uh, that could uh, point to the position and start collecting data. So there was a global effort to collect data from this um, object um, in the optical and infrared and radio wave bands as shown here. Um, radio is in green and optical and infrared are in, are, are in red. You can just see the sun setting and various observatories observe this around the world. Uh, a total of 70 telescopes across the world uh, participated in this um, effort to characterize uh, the electromagnetic properties of this um, event. Um, and um, again, here locally, what we were doing was um, what we call the growth effort, uh, which is a global relay of observatories watching transients happen. And uh, this is, uh, you know, as much as it is a network of telescopes, actually all of our telescopes in the northern hemisphere, it turned out to be more important as a network of people uh, that were continuously uh, working hard to collect this data um, from around the globe. And a network of very, uh, very bright young students and postdocs working hard to analyze this data as it comes in. And, um, and uh, each student postdoc took charge of a particular telescope or instrument and, and carried through the analysis end to end. So what did we see? Um, this here now is a compilation of the UV optical and infrared light curve. Um, the y-axis is magnitude and x-axis is time. You can see that the bluest bands faded fastest. So in a few days, the ultraviolet and optical emission had already faded away. But the reddest bands, the JH and K bands, uh, lasted for about three weeks. Um, and after this, the target went behind the sun um, and was not observable from gravity telescopes anymore. So the transient was very, very slow, uh, slowly evolving in the infrared and very rapidly fading in the bluer optical wave bands. And um, that is, um, you know, the first surprise is that this emission in the blue. Uh, was very bright and very blue at early times. Um, I mentioned that there are a variety of models that um, have been um, developed to try and explain what one might expect from neutron star neutron star mergers, uh, but perhaps all of these models were stumped by, by how bright and how blue this emission was 
and how to sustain over the, the first few days. Um, so let's hold that thought uh, when we come back to trying to put together the various models into one uh, concordant picture. Uh, but for now, let's focus on this, uh, um, on this uh, predicted uh, long-lived infrared emission. Um, so let's look at um, an infrared spectrum to begin with. Um, so this here is an infrared spectrum from the, from the Gemini South Telescope for a couple of days after the, the, uh, the merger. And what's most amazing is uh, so black is data and red is a model prediction by Dan Eason uh, from UC Berkeley about four years ago. Um, so this is just overplotting a model prediction from four years ago. This is not trying to actually fit the data. And what's really amazing is that there are these very broad features in J band and H band that are in roughly the right place um, as models predicted. And these two very, very broad features are unlike anything that we've seen in transient spectra uh, that we have observed to date. Um, so this uh, infrared spectra really hold uh, the, the key proof that the transient that we are seeing is very, very rare. And unlike any supernova or any other infrared transient that has been observed to date. And if you look at the full spectroscopic evolution, um, here I show a collection of spectra taken by the VLT extruder instrument. Um, as time ticks, you'll, you'll see that they, uh, the various spectra um, uh, come down here. Um, the spectral evolution um, is, is I mean, a treasure of the data set, which is only now beginning to be modeled to try and understand what the various bounds of the spectra are and what uh, elements these, these correspond to. Um, in Dan Payson's paper um, in 2013, um, he um, modeled all of these different elements just by one representative element, which was neodymium. He didn't even have the line transitions of the 130 elements of atomic mass numbers between 70 and, and 200. Um, so how do we know that, that one element is representative? In uh, Dan's news paper uh, written after this event, he has 14 elements that he's using to try and model this very large number of elements um, in, this, in this mass range. And it seems that neodymium is actually a very important element in the mix. If he removes neodymium, those two big bumps go away. Um, if he adds them, then, uh, then they stay. So that's possibly a hint that, that, that there is a significant uh, fraction of neodymium. There's some suggestions of cesium and uh, and I don't know what TE stands for, but I think that those are much more debated identifications here. And um, this here is, is um, uh, these spectra here, oops, sorry. Um, these spectra here uh, cover half micron to about two and a half micron. Um, just recently, about 43 days after merger, the Space Telescope has continued to detect this event in the reddest wave band, which is 4.5 micron. Um, it's a very weak detection, but a secure detection at 4.5 micron of, of a very faint, very, very red event at that late phase. Um, so uh, the idea behind trying to understand the infrared is which, I mean, is, is heavy elements. It's trying to understand where half the elements in the periodic table, heavier than iron, are in fact synthesized. And uh, while it was proposed in 1974 by Latin oil Schramm that neutron star mergers are a good site, a right site, to form heavy, heavy elements, um, and these, uh, because there's an abundance of free neutrons, there was no observational proof of this until this event um, on August 17th. But the point that I'd like to highlight to you is that heavy elements, um, the distribution of heavy elements uh, has, a, has a, if you just look at an abundance plot as a function of atomic mass number, it has three different peaks. So, um, and if you look at this, this is now absolute abundance in the solar neighborhood, and this is cumulative abundance in the, in the solar neighborhood. So you can see that the first peak is actually 80% of the mass, and the second peak is, is almost 90% of the mass. Um, so if you've, if, you've only, if you've not read the papers, and if you've only read about this event um, in the media, there's a lot of uh, talk about this is where gold and platinum and so on and so forth are being synthesized. Uh, but you should take that with a, with, with, a, with a little bit of a pinch of salt uh, because this, the, the gold and platinum are, are amongst the heaviest elements here. So they're in the third peak. And right now, uh, with the existing data, actually, if you just try to use elements in the first two peaks, 
they can very adequately explain the ground based near infrared data that we have. We don't necessarily need a lot of or, or even any of uh, these elements in the third. Now, the splits and data point is an interesting clue. It's not clear whether you need the highest opacity, uh, heaviest elements in the periodic table to try to explain the splits of data. Uh, but I would say we have, we have a great evidence here that there's at least 0.05 solar masses of, of heavy elements, but how much of which element is in which peak is very much uh, still an open question. Um, but the other thing to take away from this plot is that um, in terms of abundance, in terms of rates, is um, that given the large ejector mass of this event, which is 0.05 solar masses, at the range of these modules that value of infant strain, which is more than 300 per gigaparsec cube per year, if you multiply those two numbers, they can actually explain the observed solar abundances quite reasonably. Um, so to within a factor of two. So um, the next, the sample of say 10 events from LIGO can very clearly answer this question about whether neutron star neutron star modules are our are, are, are site or the site, the primary site of um, heavy element production. Um, but independent of the origin of um, or the distribution of the heavy elements in the various peaks, um, one of the most uh, exciting implications of this event is that it's, it's so, it has so much ejecta, it has 0.05 solar masses of ejecta, that that makes it very, very bright. And that means it's very easy to find. And um, in fact, um, this, this event is, it happened to be very nearby, it happened to be 40 megaparsec. But it's easily detectable out to advanced LIGO's um, uh, horizon of 200 megaparsec sensitivity to neutron star neutron star modules. So if we have the rates right, which is one a month, um, every um, to within a factor of two, uh, then, then small telescopes at uh, Alamar Mountain are very, very well suited to detecting the electromagnetic counterpart every single time that there is um, a neutron star neutron star merger. Uh, uh, that is visible from the, from the night sky. And um, today I'd like to, um, to highlight that uh, the Zwicky Transient Facility, which is uh, a new instrument that has just been commissioned on the Palomar uh, 48 inch telescope, uh, just announced first light. So this is a brand new camera on the 48 inch which can survey the sky at a stupendous rate of 3,750 square degrees per hour. Just to orient you, you run out of sky to observe in a few hours. Um, so this has a field of view. Uh, if you look at the Orion constellation, this is uh, the field of view. And here you're seeing the first images from this fantastic uh, CCD um, uh, system. It's a mosaic of 16 CCDs that fills the entire focal plane of the Schmidt telescope. And here you see a zoom in to the horse and nebula. Sorry, I think the lights are too bright to see this, but I'm happy to show it to you on my screen. It's um, uh, to better resolution. Um, and it, it, we just announced first light today um, of this magnificent system. So uh, next time LIGO turns on, ZTF can respond, looks at the same piece of sky that LIGO is looking at. And so the response time can be even shorter than 10 and a half hours. And we can look, at, look for these events uh, with, with an even shorter time lag. Similarly, in the infrared uh, at Palomar, we are uh, uh, <coughs> the hardware together right now um, for a very small 30 centimeter telescope with a very wide field of view, 25 square degree field of view. And the idea is to survey the, the night sky, 15,000 square degrees, every night in J band to about um, 16th magnitude. So the various pieces, uh, this is an image of, of the mechanical assembly that's already done downstairs. The detector, which just needs some housing, um, and the uh, and the, the mount is already at Palomar. So, so I'm very optimistic that the system should um, see first light in January. But now I'd like to take the last um, few minutes and just step back and try and put together the pieces of this um, uh, this electromagnetic counterpart to the gravitational wave event of March 17 and put it together into one important astrophysical picture. So let's first begin with what it is not. Um, so there were two surprises uh, with this event. Um, yes, there was a burst of gamma rays, but this burst of gamma rays is very different from any other gamma ray burst that has been observed. In fact, the luminosity of this gamma ray burst at the systems of 40 megaparsec was about 10,000 times lower 
then that, then that distribution of cosmological um, short-term doubling bursts. And uh, on that account, um, you basically know immediately that, that it could not be um, a line of sight very weak short-term gamma ray burst, and it could not be a, a, a cycle of axis short-term gamma ray burst. So the, uh, if, you, if you think about uh, gamma ray burst being defined in the Lorentz factor of 100 ultra relativistic jet that's, that's um, uh, piercing through this material, um, the gamma ray luminosity drops the Lorentz factor to the four. So if you want to explain this, this first point, which is the fact that the gamma ray luminosity was lower than a factor of 10,000, you need to be only slightly off axis, which is about 0.1 radian off axis. But if you want to explain this, this third point here, which is the delayed onset of the radio and x-rays, you need to be very, very widely um, off axis. So this model is in, it, it, of trying to be an off axis gamma ray burst is in deep trouble to, to, to self-consistently explain the data at hand. Um, so the idea that we came up with um, ruling out um, a, a long list of, um, of simpler possibilities is that uh, what we were looking at is um, the breakout of the cocoon. Um, so let me explain that um, a little bit more. So uh, when the two neutron stars merge and the jet is launched, it's not launched into a pristine environment. There's about two tenths of solar mass material lying around at the time the jet is launched. So if you just focus on, on, uh, on the left is energetics and the right is the kinematics, and if you just focus on this uh, simulation here, you see that the jet gets, um, gets choked and transfers all of its energy into this cocoon of material that is much wider angle and much lower Lorentz factor. So Lorentz factor of 100, we're not talking about Lorentz factors of two or three, so it's the mildly relativistic regime. And then when this wide angle, uh, mildly relativistic, cocoon of material that engulfs the jet breaks out of the material, that is what gives you the very, very low luminosity gamma rays. When this cocoon of material uh, is, is deformed and uh, it accelerates a lot of the material here, and the acceleration of the material can actually give you a doctor boost and explain that early bright blue emission that was giving uh, existing models a lot of trouble. And then when this cocoon possibly interacts, with, uh, has a curvature of interacts with the, with the stellar medium, it could explain the radio uh, data that, that Greg is going to tell you about a little bit more. Um, so uh, there are some very fun aspects of this model that are testable as we are still collecting the data. Um, and uh, here what I'm showing you is, is how well the cocoon does to explain the volumetric light curve um, shown here as a function of time. So red is, uh, don't worry about the subcomponents, red, the sort of red line is, is, a, is a simulation done by Regina Carr and Student Four got like um, to reproduce um, the, the data that is observed here. For a wide range of parameters, you can explain this early blue emission, which is hard to explain in other Newtonian models that have been, uh, that existed in the literature before this. So what does this model mean for the connection between neutron star neutron star modules and short term gamma ray bursts? Is there a connection between the two? Um, or are they completely distinct and related phenomena? So here you, you see again that the light curves in the, in the different wave bands. And, and the zoom into these specific bands also shows other, other gamma ray bursts that have been shown to have some optical or infrared emission. And Although this is only one data point here and um, in each of these cases, it, at least for three out of the five cases, um, there appears to be a connection. So the question that I'd like to leave you with is what is the fate of the jet? Um, is it the case that in some cases the jet manages to pierce out and there's both a cocoon and a jet? So if there was an uh, observer along the line of sight, you would see a short here, but if there was an observer that was along a different line of sight, then they would see this might be relativistic wide angle cocoon. Or are we in this regime where uh, the, the cocoon um, has actually completely choked the jet and there is no, uh, no pollinated jet in any direction? And to answer this question, I'd like to hand off to, to Greg to, um, to tell you about the radio. Thanks, Marcy. All right, so I'm going to talk about the, uh, the radio uh, detection of this event and, uh, as Mark suggested, 
how it impacts our interpretation of various models. Um, so this is part of a larger group that included, you know, the, the, the growth collaboration. I also want to mention that the uh, uh, the actual VLA program that originally we had at a section, where this is like a Jaguar seminar. Uh, a seminar. This is the Jaguar uh, VLA program led by Kunal Muli. So the name is completely coincidental, but very similar to the seminar name for today. All right, so uh, to first kind of give an indication of what kind of components you may see radio emission from in this event, I'm going to show a uh, animation. That should play. Oh, hang on, sorry. I know it's wrong. I have to transfer over the, uh, the mouse. <laughs> sorry. It was playing the video by the wrong screen. Okay, try that again. Okay, here is a, an animation from our colleagues at NASA which shows the final uh, inspiral of this, this heat star binary and the eventual merger, and you'll see the various components of ejecta. Uh, it includes, uh, of course, the jet formation, and then a kilonova, which has a few, few percent of solar mass thrown out in track with the ISM, or we have heavy ion formation, then you have the, the possibility of a jet and its interaction with the ISM. And I want to talk about these components now and how they might reduce radio emission. So first off, I want to talk about the Klinova ejecta. The few percent of solar mass that's thrown out at, you know, 20% of the speed of light. Uh, it's, it interacts with the ISM, it sweeps with the ISM and forms a, uh, a synchrotron afterglow. The uh, time scale and luminosity are very sensitive to the function of the energetics of the fireball, uh, as well as the density of the surrounding interstellar medium. The time scales you typically expect for uh, these kind of events is months to years. This particular radio component arrives. The second possibility is the presence of a relativistic jet. And Nizami theorized that uh, even star mergers are the possible central engine for short gamma ray bursts. Uh, and that's based on, and the, the, the uh, short gamma ray bursts by definition require a very high relativistic jet, and that implies that maybe these star mergers are not such jets. This has never been directly confirmed by an in situ, about the presence of a simultaneous. Uh, gamma ray burst and a confirmed uh, neutron star merger. This is the first actual event where we know for sure there was a neutron star merger, and we can now look for evidence of the presence of early missing jet. Uh, so, uh, this is going to be 40 megaparsecs, we can see it potentially on or off axis. Uh, in this case, uh, you have a light curve that rises on the time scale of days to weeks. Uh, once again, sensitive to the surrounding density of interstellar medium, but also your line of sight relative to the axis of the jet. Looking down the, the barrel of the jet, you'll see a, a brighter, faster rising afterglow. And the third possibility that the mass is already introduced is the possibility that the jet launches into ejecta and uh, dumps a significant fraction or all of its energy into the ejecta, forming a cocoon that itself breaks out uh, a minor electric cocoon and it produces emission from gamma rays to radio. Uh, and there are two possibilities here. One, that the jet launch, dumps all its energy into the cocoon, and that would give you a strong radio afterglow. The other possibility is the jet can, can break through, like Monty showed, and then you have a weaker cocoon. In this case, the time scales are on weeks to months. So we have these three different time scales for, for these different types of ejecta, months to years, days to weeks, weeks to months. And of course, you can't go to a radio telescope and say we well, need a VLA for the next year every day. Uh, they would say no. Uh, so we have to actually rely on uh, other information to try and constrain our observing strategy. Happily, we're in the era of multi-messenger astronomy. We had lots of information that we were able to draw on to plan how best to follow up the event. After the issue of detection of gamma rays, as Matt described, was a very weak gamma ray, uh, admission of gamma rays, 1.7 seconds after the event. Then there was the ensuing optical and ultraviolet and near infrared afterglow, uh, which had so much more information coded in the nature of the heavy element information in the, in the ejecta. And then about uh, nine days after the event, there was X-ray detection, and more recently, uh, Mantis Group have found the detection of the Spitzer bands. Now this X-ray detection is really the most informative aspect for when to follow up the, uh, the radio. That's because there have been you know, very sensitive observations in the days following the event with Chandra, uh, with Swift, with Newstar, that have put limits on an associated X-ray afterglow uh, with the actual gamma ray events, and clearly demonstrated this, this X-ray emission was a new component, a rising component. And that's exactly what's predicted for a number of models, including uh, an off-axis jet and the cocoon model that Monty uh, described. So we were kind of discussing this very closely in the days prior and following this X-ray detection. And really when this X-ray 
source of peers, we really ramped up our efforts to get a detection of radio waves. So our collaboration had uh, a, a lot of resources to try and follow up with radio. We were following up with gigahertz frequencies and relied on uh, primarily our, 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 the, the very large radio Mexico, which is still the most sensitive and largest in the phenomenon on the planet. We also were using the giant medium wave radio telescope in India, the compact array in Australia, and we were trying to do the, these kind of observations in a coordinated fashion, such that we were able to get on source uh, on an almost daily basis in the days following the X-ray detection. Uh, here now on the left is our first detection, uh, a four and a half signal detection. Here's your source right here. So here I'm, I'm just comparing your radio observation and, uh, and one of the mounted images of approximately the scale. You can see that the bright radio source coincides with the center of the galaxy. It turns out to have a host of very weak uh, axis nucleus. And here uh, is our actual radio source associated with the location of the, the merger event. This was actually after about two days of intensive data analysis when I first saw the source. I was looking my eyes, making sure it was real, but uh, I worked with Canal Mooney throughout the night and we actually established it was real. And then the, the next morning we heard from another colleague of ours, uh, Alexander Corsi, who observed the VLA immediately after us and got a detection of it and fixed it on. So we knew we had our, our source. A few days later, then, or a couple of days later, uh, the compact array also made a detection. What really was the confirmation that this was our source was the fact that over the following two weeks we saw a clear revolution in flux density as the source increased in brightness. Uh, so, uh, before I discuss uh, uh, how we can use this data to constrain the energetics, the environment of the, of the, of the event, and you know, resolve some of these questions about the components that are, that are involved in the, in the event, uh, I want to talk about some other data we took that wasn't actually trying to characterize the afterglow, uh, but we're actually trying to characterize separately the environment of the explosion. So, we try to measure, or get, get, at least get some constraints on what we might expect for the density surrounding the environment, how to constrain our models. We use the Green Bank Telescope to observe the galaxy and do a deep integration to try and constrain the presence of neutral hydrogen. So here is uh, the neutral hydrogen line uh, uh, at the uh, velocity, at the rate of velocity of this gal galaxy, and we have plus or minus 100 kilometers. Here we show that we have no credible detection of any neutral hydrogen that we can see with, this, with the Green Bank Telescope at the location of the galaxy. And that was quite a sensitive observation, and we were able to, using you know, very conservative models, constrain what the amount of uh, uh, neutral hydrogen mass there is in the galaxy, and the implied local number density for the event, which is less than about 0 0.04 electrons per centimeter cubed at the location uh, of the, uh, the merger, which was a good prior for, for us in terms of kind of uh, what we might expect from the radio afterglow. So getting on, oh, uh, in terms of how we actually model the radio afterglow, this is our modeling team, uh, theory team, which is Udi Dakar, Ken Kodak and Steve Garan, and they use a numerical code described in Sonnenberg et al. Uh, 2006, and the results are also verified in Henry with boxes. We know that, or we expect rather, that the radio emission is also from the same uh, components of synchron emission that gives you the X-ray, so we also try to, where possible, constrain the data to be consistent with the X-ray emission. Uh, the first way we can do that is by looking at the spectrum. So we know the, the, the detection of the X-ray emission is at nine, which is nine days post-merger. Other observations, 16 days post-merger, place further constraints. Uh, we have observations a few days later that we try to use to constrain the radio to X-ray spectrum, assuming you have the single components producing the uh, radio and X-rays. And what you see is that you get a, you get a uh, uh, the electron energy distribution is, is about 2.1. Uh, if you assume the radio and X-rays uh, are from the same component, which is a little bit less than what you see typically for for uh, gamma ray bursts, for example, about 2.4, but uh, still consistent with expectation that you, there are events that are that are lower and equal to about 2.1. All right, uh, I want to talk for a minute about this concept of a classical short GRB, and when I say a classical short GRB, I'm talking about short gamma ray bursts that are in a certain range of luminosity that we have been expecting uh, with experiments like SWIFT for the last couple of decades. Uh, like Monty mentioned, there was a burst of gamma rays detected, but it was quite weak. In terms of the isotopic equivalent luminosity, it's about 10 to 4 times less than we see uh, for the significant classical gamma ray burst population. So uh, how do we interpret that in the context of uh, whether or not there was a classical short therapy? A lot of evidence already has been presented by Monty to rule out the, the, the possibility that we're looking at this jet 
we're looking at this a, a classic gamma ray burst uh, uh, looking down the axis, right? Uh, there was no bright X-ray afterglow. Um, a jet that was that was breaking through this uh, I talked with Luminosity would be would, would actually find it very difficult to break through. And there's lots of other reasons why we can actually say it's, it's almost certainly not on axis. So what are we seeing? Are we seeing a faster gamma ray burst slightly off axis? And that's where the radio data actually was most constraining uh, uh, in, 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 with respect to this gamma ray burst detection. Uh, if you did see a gamma ray burst, a classic gamma ray burst slightly off axis, as Monty described, it turns out you would have seen a very bright radioactive glow. Here is our uh, radio data. Uh, Following in terms of our detection of uh, flux density at 2 gigahertz and time to merger. And you can compare that to what you would expect if you viewed a gamma ray burst. A classic gamma ray burst, just slightly off axis. And it turns out for densities you typically might see for short gamma ray bursts, the accepted light curve is, is completely consistent with the data. Even using a much lower density is not what it is still consistent. In fact, in order to match the data with a slightly off-axis jet, you have to use an extremely low density that you do not expect to see in a galaxy like the one we see. Uh, so I think that's one of the strongest means we can rule out a slightly off-axis jet. Which then therefore means the third possibility, the one that's been you know, widely adapted and interpreted, is that we're looking at something that is widely off-axis. And then the open question remains whether we're looking at a, you know, a uh, Rendered to suggest a normal GOB, or whether we're looking at a cocoon. And there's lots of discussion, like for example, Monty's paper and, that, and elsewhere about, about these possibilities, and the radio data will be very powerful in, in, in answering that question. Uh, and, and how so? Well, it's going to try and constrain, or we can compare the light curve against expectations of these different types of projectile. Uh, first of all, uh, it's unlikely we're seeing this Kilonova projectile. It turns out that the time scales we see this rise on uh, would, would, would require a very high velocity tail to the kilonova. Uh, and that's possible, we haven't ruled it out yet, but that can't explain the X rays, the gamma rays, or anything else. What about the off axis jet versus the cocoon question, which is a big question? Uh, and whether you see somewhere in the universe a normal passive gamma ray burst? And that's where the radio uh, will answer the question. Uh, I'll show you how in, in the next few slides. So uh, our data, our initial data, remains consistent with the possibility of either an off-axis jet shown here in orange, or either a cocoon or a uh, weak cocoon or a strong cocoon. Uh, but in the days and weeks and months following the merger, if we continue continue to monitor the radio, it will <coughs> resolve between these models. How so? Well, in the case of a weak cocoon, uh, or indeed a kilonova uh, high velocity tail, you expect uh, uh, a light curve consistent with a spherical or quasi spherical uh, ejecta uh, fireball. Uh, if you assume a single velocity that gives you a light curve that rises approximately as t cubed, you see very different behavior for an off axis jet. You'll see a, a faster rise followed by a broad plateau uh, and, a, and a drop off. And the light curve alone will distinguish between those two models. Now, the models I'm showing here uh, for the uh, cocoon are just those consistent with a single velocity, the front velocity of the ejecta. It's also possible to use, for the spherical or quasi spherical case, a velocity gradient to treat the, uh, the data. We didn't do that for our initial paper because we didn't have enough data to constrain uh, uh, those models. Uh, however, a follow up paper. Uh, taking the example of a strong cocoon, did actually use velocity gradient to fit our data. And what's key here is that you can indeed use a velocity gradient uh, to model the, uh, the cocoon or the kilonova ejecta. It is not consistent with an off-axis jet. So as we watch this light curve, we will clearly resolve between either an off-axis jet or a spherical or quasi-spherical ejecta. The latter being either a cocoon or the kilonova tail. How do we resolve the kilonova tail and the uh, uh, cocoon? We rely on the speed of the ejecta. And that's by looking at the size of the fireball. Here now is a plot showing the angular diameter uh, versus time to merger for the various types of ejecta. <coughs> Here I'm showing a cocoon for gamma equals 2, and you've got the option of being choked, 
I, I, a strong, a strong coon, or, a, or in the J for the, the J for itself, a weak coon, here's an off axis jet, here is the, the much slower traveling sub relativistic ejecta. This is probably a prettier representation of, that, of those three possibilities. Here I'm trying to show those same images I had before, now to scale, including our solar system to scale as well, also. As you can see, you expect much larger ejecta size for the relativistic jet uh, and the cocoon models. And this is this being much larger again than anyone can uh, the cocoon breaks out that. And it turns out we can use radio observations to measure that size. That's a, a technique that's, that is a long heritage here at Caltech, of course, VLBI. We're in the process now of combining telescopes right across the continent in the US and beyond to create a telescope essentially the size of the globe. We're using the VLBA, which includes 10 antennas across the US, including one of the Owens Valley Radio Observatory managed by Caltech. Uh, we're adding in the Green Bank Telescope, the largest single spherical dish in the, in, in the world, and we're, we're keeping the VLA also. That gives us 38 dishes for a lot of sensitivity and baselines of about 9,000 kilometers. Those baselines give the image at milliard second scale, which it turns out is enough resolution to actually resolve the size of the fireball. That means we can actually measure the size and directly establish how big this fireball is, and that would distinguish between the possibility of a Kilonova high velocity tail versus, for example, a cocoon. So the idea being that we can get the first snapshot uh, picture of uh, a star merger. It looked look more like this, like a vlog. <laughs> <laughs> concept is the same. So uh, we've been taking these data over the last, we've been observing for years, and we can show you data. Uh, very soon, I hope we can. And uh, it'll appear, uh, in the, the, the follow-up papers will start appearing very soon. The radio may still keep on rising for the next year, year or so. Uh, the last thing I want to briefly mention is other possible sources of radio emission we might try and detect in the future. In particular, uh, the possibility of a prompt, low-frequency pulse associated with the neutral star merger. This uh, is, uh, has been predicted by a number of papers. It's highly speculative, as they have called it, it's pixie dust. The reason why I think it's exciting is because this could give you a prompt or precursor signal, which in the case of gravitational wave astronomy, is potentially very exciting. So the idea being that you can detect a prompt pulse at a, at a few tens of megahertz, for example, due to interaction of the millennium spheres of the two neutral stars as they emerge. So we have a new telescope that's come online that images the entire sky that we hope to try and use to constrain the presence of this kind of low frequency pulse of radio emission uh, from these events. Even if it's speculative, we think it's important to try and constrain its presence for, for a population. Uh, the array consists of 352 antennas across 2.6 kilometers. The full array is not, is not finished yet, but we have 288 antennas across 1.6 kilometers. We do full cross star rays with all antennas. Gives you an all-sky field, field of view, and it's the most powerful array below 100 megahertz. Uh, here's a quick... Here's a quick movie that shows uh, just the uh, uh, center of the array and all the dipoles that are there, with some graduate students for scale. And I'll very quickly move on and just show, here's an example of a single image from the array, the whole being that we can try an image during a, a merger event. We've been already doing this for short gamma ray bursts, which we think are also due to a merger, but just much further away. Uh, here is a data set that, that, that will appear on ACVH this week. This is a three hour data set centered on a gamma ray burst where we look for a detection of radio emission associated with that event. We did not get a detection. If we were observing at the time of the nuclear merger, we would have a much greater chance of detection because it's much closer. Uh, unfortunately, it was below the horizon. Here's the image 12 hours before GW170817. Here's the localization region. Uh, we cover the entire hemisphere. That's only half the sky, and of course it was below the horizon when it happened. But in 03, the next observing run of LIGO, I really hope we can try to get very strong constraints on whether or not you have this kind of radio emission which will give you prompt or precursor emission as a way to try and track the location of these events. Okay, I'll stop there. In summary, radio observations are ongoing and will be for the next year. Light curves and VLBI data should be able to resolve between a 
cocoon, uh, between the cocoon orbit ejector, uh, cocoon, and an off axis jet. This is a big open question among the community in hotly debated. Uh, the actual cocoon orbit jet takes months or years to rise, so watch this space. And in the future, I hope we might try and search for a prompt pulse precursor uh, to the events. And I'll stop there. Thank you. you've got the interactive mediaspheres. But, I mean, those, those models are highly speculative. They all do agree that the, the emission is at low frequencies, below 100, typically. Um, uh, the, the, re the real attraction here, I mean, the, the radio emission you see at gigahertz frequencies is much more reliable. And that's where most of our, our effort will be focused, because it's stop hitting stuff, and you see synchrotron. Um, the reason why the low frequency component is still worth following, though, is the idea of it being prompt or precursor. That's a powerful thing to have. If you have a precursor pulse that tells you you're going to see a merger in, in an hour, uh, being able to give that pre trigger to, to other telescopes would be a huge advantage. You showed a slide kind of like Features is probably a blend of many different elements. Um, we have quantity of quite some masses of um, material, but, are, but a large number of different elements and light transitions that are contributing to that light. So it's probably a blend, and, and velocities are very high. Velocities here are between 0.1 to 0.3 c, uh, depending on what the time of the gap. So the, the high velocities and the large number of light transitions in that region um, smear out the, the feature into a very, very broad and uh, there are a few different broad features. One is the J band, then the H band, and then later it becomes more prominent in the A band. Um, and the remains to be seen which elements are responsible, uh, or most responsible for, for those elements. Okay. I'm just wondering about the time scale of the gathering pulse that was seen. It was about two seconds after the, the merger. Is that in your model the beginning of the 
jet before it gets choked and just see that and then the stops. Is that, is that how it works? It's a breakout. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a, that's a boom breakout. So that's not it's model dependent, and you know, the, it certainly the, the parameters can be tuned for a 1.2 second uh, breakout. And the uh, Gottlieb et al. paper that uh, Monty and I kind of flashed up uh, talked about the model parameters you require for a 1.7 uh, second cocoon breakout that gives you those gamma rays. Um, you know, their gamma, they're, they see a cocoon with gamma 3 on those time scales. And there's also two reference ranges. Maybe you should have seen a different reference range than right. the observer reference range. That your simulation can very good at the reproduce the one with seven, seven, seven second time lapse, the, the simulation that you saw, but just be careful which time you're going to take. Right. The time locally or the time with the. depending on you know, the three, three or four different papers, all of which happen to predict a low frequency pulse. In one case, it's a uh, radio pulse that ramps upwards. I was talking about dispersion. Then. Hmm? He's talking about the... Um, no, uh, uh, so let's look through dispersion here. No, uh, this is a, you're on a, it, a precursor, right? Well, yeah. If, if T0 is the reception of gravitational waves, right. uh, where is the radio... So in, in one model, in, in particular, which is the interactive linear model, you see a ramp up of radio power that peaks at the time of merger, but it's actually a slow ramp. Okay, so that's the magnetospheres of the Exactly. System. That's the interactive linear spheres as they come together. Yeah. And it's, it's a, quite a, a shallow power wall rise. Mm -hmm. so what's the delay? Uh, for this particular event? Or if you're at 75 megahertz, what's the typical delay? Uh, oh, it's depend depending on, the, on your orientation out of the galaxy and, and into the galaxy, but it's not, not going to be much. At 40 megabytes, it's not much. Yeah. And this radio emission does have a shallow rise, so I think it's perfectly useful to set up a precursor to this event. Here's a question. Jim? Yeah. Nancy, in the, in the plot you showed that's a, a spectrum of the, of the kilonova, you overlay the, the model from Dan Kaysen and you point at the broad features that you know seem very similar. Mm -hmm. Very cool. It by eye it looks like the peaks don't line up exactly. And you mentioned it's not really a fit. Do you know either what the uncertainty um, in those peak locations are or what's the parameter that might be tunable to, to make them fit? Um, I think that's a great question, Juna, but right now I don't think Dan can even begin to answer that. I mean, um, he's gone from one element to uh, nine transitions in that to 14. Uh, now Salamos has a few more that they are, they are working on. But we are trying to use, uh, represent 130 or so elements by a handful of fine transitions. Um, they just don't exist complete lists of tables of lines and opacities uh, here. So, um, so the fact that it was bouncing in roughly in the same place is already, I would say, striking. I mean, to do it more accurately, um, I think it's, it's months and not years of work. Yeah, but that, that actually answers my question really well, which is that the main uncertainty is in trying to include more of the elements that make it And, and how much of which of those emission elements do you include? Do you assume the same relative the abundance that you see in solar neighborhood, or do you try to, is a metallicity dependent on the two galaxy happened in them? And how much was lost to mixing versus actual production in that particular site? Thank you. Many notes. Following the presentation, um, we do have some, some snacks out front, and we can continue the conversation there. I'd like to thank our speakers for an excellent talk. On this.
So um, the line transitions was um, as 